Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunov, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Astuba Das. Welcome to the show, everybody. Welcome to Sleep In Sunday. Today we sleep, sleep in. in a little bit. If you like to sleep in, you can sleep in a little bit because we start at 8 o'clock. If you're listening to this on Facebook, we do this every day. It's a it's a uh, systematic study of the sacred literature of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is considered the cream of the crop. The top of the... Heap? Top of the heap. Okay. Top of the heap of all the Vedic teachings why because it connects the the soul the jiva which is which is sort of lost in this material world with its source therefore leaving us all as bhakti sorcerers hmm? and today we have an interview we have a great interview day but before we introduce our wonderful um our guest um kostuba how are you i'm doing great all is good yeah all right uh mara do you have any interesting announcements for us uh, yes, we have a Bhakti Recovery Group meeting at 9.30 today. Nityananda Chandra Shloka Study Group is at 9 o'clock. And we also have the Global Puja for Ukraine. The first part of it starts at 9 a.m. right after the show. That's all right. I want to start. I want to just join the Shloka Study Group with Nityananda Chandra. They do that Saturday and Sunday right after the show? Yes, I think so. <laughs> Somebody could put <laughs> it on the chat board, but Nitin on the Chandra, is he on today? He could or if you're on in that group. If you're on that group, put it on the Karuna's chat board how to get there. on that group. Jeffrey and can Yaffer. others join that? Is that for Patreon members only? Is it... It's for Patreon members. Okay. Patreon members, community supported podcast people. If you like what we're doing, Wisdom of the Sages 108. No. If you like what we're doing, patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. Thank you very much for all those who support us. It's really welcome. So, um, Kostuba, without yeah. further ado, you want to introduce our wonderful guest? I would be happy to. You know, this is a very, very, very special guest that we have today. This is in, in ISKCON, in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. This is one of the most senior members um, and, 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 you know, person that I think to Raghunath and I, I've, I've said this before because we've had some of her close associates on before. We've had Shama Sundar Prabhu. And we've had Bakunda Goswami before, but these were some of the very earliest disciples of Srila Prabhupada, who, in our minds, they they really embodied a spirit, a spirit of, in my mind, it's a combination of a couple of things. It's a combination of like they were kind of like cool and creative people, that just you know they were you know they were just very dynamic in how they served and very creative, but also they were really like fully surrendered like they gave their lives in a way to serve their guru and to serve to bring bhakti to the to the world uh with with a kind of like a abandonment you know that was like so full and complete that it's it's always been very inspiring to me and to so many others but our guest today is malati prabhu malati um was one of those very early disciples and uh she's been serving uh Srila Prabhupada and serving to bring bhakti to the people of the world since 1967. Um, since 1998, she's been a member of the ISKCON's governing body, which means it's like really like the highest level of management uh, in the organization. I think she's responsible for large portions of the Midwest and maybe Florida as well. 
Um, but just a person that is full of, I'm not Florida anymore. Okay. Not Florida. Right. <laughs> Sorry for people. In Florida. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but in any case, she's, she's a, a person that's, um, just, you know, that's led a, a most incredible life of uh, devotional service. So Malti Prabhu, we're very honored to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Hare Krishna. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> no. You know, Malati, also, I, I just wanted to share that, uh, that posse that you hung out with there in the 60s, it, it's almost like you guys were demigods sent to spread bhakti all over the world. I, 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 in reflection, you met the guru, you met the master, and you, and it was like, it was like you were sent. I mean, you really were empowered and you didn't know anything. I mean, you were new. All you had was like this incredibly deep faith in your guru. It's not like you were um, academia st studying Hinduism. You met a person that inspired you and you're like, OK, we're going to run with this. And you fully embraced Guru Bhakti. It's the most impressive thing. And what Kostuba was saying as it was your creativity and your coolness that just made it. I, I look up to you guys so much, this you and Yamuna and Shamasunder and Mukunda and Gurudas. You guys are like my biggest heroes. And so I, I am super honored to have you uh, share your story. And, you know, Bhakti became so big and became like an international society. Now it's all over the world. You go to India, you see Russian devotees of Krishna. You see Israeli devotees of Krishna. You, you see devotees. But you guys were that intimate core people who had time with Prabhupada before he was like a general when he was just like a, a wandering Swami on the Lower East Side. And it's such a different vantage point than the rest of the rest of the devotees out there. And you have so much interesting stories to tell. And we're hoping to get some out of you today. <laughs> but you mentioned cool and creative. Mm. I would say I would include somewhat fearlessly crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. A little bit, cool. a little bit crazy. <laughs> a little bit crazy. I forgot to mention that part of the bio. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was almost like reckless like if someone from an outsider might look at it and say it was like almost reckless how you gave your lives so fully like for instance you met Srila Prabhupada in 1967 is that correct I met him yes actually technically I met him in 66 on the top of a mountain in Oregon via the first edition of the Bhagavatam okay so you read his book uh, I didn't just prior it. to that. I was presented to it by um, Michael Grant, who had become Mukunda. Right. Had been pals. So, so you had a, a group of friends, and you were sometimes in Oregon and sometimes there in that Haight Ashbury scene in San Francisco. And two yeah. of them had gone to New York, met Shil Prabhupada, and come back. And they brought this yeah. message. Were you, before that, were you, did you have an interest oh, in. Pardon? I'm sorry. Before he, they came back, did you have? Were you pursuing Eastern spirituality and things like that? Um, we were seekers, mm -hmm. so we were looking in many directions, but we had no guidelines. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we met a lot of weird people. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and there are plenty to meet then in San Francisco I, in 1967. I, don't know. I mean, I could right. give names; you wouldn't even probably know them. But like Sybil Leak, she was a world famous um, witch. Okay, world famous uh, witch. You got yeah. Roganas detention now. Not witch, not witch. Yeah, I mean Sybil Leak. You can look her up. There was another so-called guru, who dear friends of ours joined with, and they were sure, just like when you find something you really like. You want to give it to others. We were mm -hmm. the same way, but you know we hadn't found Prabhupada yet, and they found somebody. So we went to see them, and it was such a, I would say, a disgusting shock. Sorry to say, but their guru, two things: he had a pig farm, and he told them to take care of it, and they had this humongous snake, I mean, a <laughs> very big one, and they. The day we came, it was time to feed the snake. <laughs> you can oh. imagine. I mean, live creatures. Wow. <laughs> I couldn't wrap my head around this 
pig farming snake eating, you know, this live animal eating snake. What, where was the spirituality in all this? I mean, <laughs> okay. certainly it was there, but that wasn't for me. But well, the, shocks. Uh, you know, the picture that I get of you from Shama Sunaprabhu is you were this very cool girl driving around Haight Ashbury on your motorcycle at the time. And just you guys are kind of in touch with like, you know, the Grateful Dead and, uh, you know, all of these kind of uh, counterculture characters from that time. Like you were really right in the middle of it. Somehow or other. Okay. And so then Srila Prabhupada came and, and, you, and you spent time with him there and you helped him set up a, a storefront temple uh, in the Haight-Ashbury district there. And, and, and that became... Uh, I guess the second Hare Krishna temple in, in, yeah. in ISKCON's history. It was um, up on the mountain. It was kind of determined, okay, um, the former Mike Grant, now Mukunda, uh, which was kind of interesting because he went to New York to get, you know, a little into the musical industry on a higher level than you could get in Portland and Oregon. Mm -hmm. And um, he was writing these letters. He played Thelonious Monk, this person, that person. And then he met a Swami. <laughs> okay, well, and then what I'm thinking of the pig farmer Swami, I'm like, oh no, another one. And, <laughs> and then he said he was, they were getting married. He'd gone out with his girlfriend, Jan. And I thought, oh my God, this is getting serious because in those days, you know, the hippies, the hippie Sampradaya, we did not believe in marriage. <laughs> the hippie Sampradaya, that's a good one. Yeah, we didn't, <laughs> I'm we from didn't, the punk rock Sampradaya. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many Sampradayas. Um, anyways, Sampradayas, for those who may not know, hmm. means a school of thought hmm. or a form, you know, a, a philosophical practice and hmm. that kind of thing. Anyway, um, for reasons which probably go best unspoken, Sham and I ended up on the top of this mountain in Portland. And um, it was a fire lookout. You would look for forest fires up and spend the summer up there. Yeah. Um, we left, you could say, on a dime. We left Portland. In fact, I came home and I see everything's in our car. We had one of those old fashioned station wagons they used to have, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, are we going somewhere? And he goes, well, I am. And if you want to go hop in, and that was just really funny because um, that's how we ended up getting together. I was hitchhiking in New Mexico and I wasn't getting anywhere. I was on Highway 1 in Northern California. And this van pulls up. I goes, hop in. And I'm like, he was going north. I was going south. He goes, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, how long have you been here? Well, you know, we didn't use watches in those days, so, but it had been a while. He goes, well, hop in. At least you'll get somewhere. So I did. <laughs> Yeah. That's how I got to Oregon. I see. So now we're on this mountain. We left kind of suddenly and driving like we didn't know. Where, he didn't know and neither did I where we were going. But then it came a, um, it was getting dark, getting late, pulled in to a, um, you know, now we're in the country, way vast wilderness area, pulled into a, a federal, what are they called? Federal parks. Anyway, National Park. National Park. And, um, you know, going to camp for the night. And when I woke up in the morning, he wasn't there, but stuff was there, so I knew he would be back. And when he came back, he goes, well, I got a job. And you know, we're in the middle of a forest. I got a job. Great. Um, but he'd met a forest ranger. And the fellow told him that just the day before, the fellow that was going to be the lookout had quit and had Sham said he was interested, took him up, he passed, he aced the test, he's really good out in the Fort Woods, and suddenly that we ended up on the top of this mountain. So then we get the information, you know, they're getting married, and we didn't hear much, and one day we had a day off, we went to another mountain, and when we came back, there was a car, and um, we go into our cabin, it's like a little wooden cabin, no bathroom, there was a, a creek running by. So, you know, everything you needed to do, you did it outside. And uh, we go in and there's Jan, Mike and Joan, the sister of Jamuna, I mean, the sister of um, Jan, who had gone to New York for the wedding to help her sister's wedding. 
And um, so now we find out, okay, they're married, that the marriage has gone on. They got new names. Like, what's next? Well, new names. Um, okay. Mike was Mukunda, Jan was Janaki. Joan was still Joan, okay, things, you know. Things <laughs> and um, she, we had a wood stove. Janet was already cooking when we, we came in. And, um, but it looked really interesting. She had these little, like, some dough. She'd make these balls, flatten them out, roll them out, stick them on the fire. They'd puff up, and it was pretty interesting. And, you know, when a guest arrives, you're supposed to, you know, offer them something. And they'd kind of already, like, offered themselves, you know, they were in there. So then we offered them some LSD. And they surprisingly said, no, thank you. <laughs> okay, there was another one. You know? Things are changing around here. Okay. <laughs> and then it's time for dinner, and we find out actually now they're vegetarians. I mean, now that's like, you know, normal thing. But honestly, in the '60s, being a vegetarian was suspect. Rare, yeah. So it was like you could be a communist. It was like that kind of, you know, hmm. vegetarian. Something's wrong. So yeah. they're vegetarian. We didn't mind things being wrong. I mean, that was part of being a hippie. You didn't. You know, so, uh, okay, this is cool. We're having the dinner. And then Makunda announced after dinner, he wanted to show us something special, a special book. And that book was the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in three parts that Srila Prabhupada had brought over in his trunk from India. So that was my meeting because when I looked at that, well, first of all, you know, hippies weren't sure about a lot of things like God. Mm -hmm. Maybe you were God, I'm God, you're all God. Um, maybe God doesn't exist. You remember the Time Cover, or maybe you're too young, but it, the Time Cover magazine, it said God is dead. It was like, you know, so here in this book, it, I, I, I'd had enough experiences to know something beyond me, something beyond this little life I was, you know, living and breathing. There was something, but I didn't know what it was. And I didn't know if it was God, I didn't know. But it couldn't be like us. When I was, you know, when people would say, oh, you're God, I'm God, I'm like, holy hell. <laughs> it's like, there is no hope for this world. <laughs> so um, in that book, you know, the first of all, I've changed the cover a little bit, but there's like this like little bubble and then there's a lot of little bubbles. And in the big bubble, there's this fellow with blue skin four arms, you know, big helmet on his head, and even more astounding, he's got a plant growing out of his navel and on the, <laughs> going up. And on the top of the plant is another blue skin fellow with four heads. And like, you know, and then all the other little bubbles had four-headed, four-handed people. And I'm like, who is this? Intriguing. And it's taught not sort of as like, look at this interesting psychedelic photo. It's taught as this is your reality, actually, that well, you can't well, perceive it. It's not a myth. This is a reality going on that you're just not aware of. Well, when I asked Makunda, he go, who is this? I mean, I didn't say, what is it? I said, who? And he said, very soberly, this is God. <laughs> and I completely embraced it because it, like, yes god isn't like us we may be somewhat a little bit like him but he's certainly not like us this person was definitely like no one i'd ever seen floating in space so i felt some interest and then i opened the book and one phrase just kept repeating itself the supreme personality of godhead the supreme personality of godhead you know, where, where did you hear this before? Is, so that see, was my introduction to Prabhupada, and that was why I wanted to meet him. Hmm. You see, Kostuba, this is what I don't understand about people like Malati. These, these, they're, they're just so like, they read one line, they saw one picture, and they're like, yes. I am like the constant doubter, cynic, trying to like weigh things out. She's just, it's just full foot, from a picture, she has full faith. That's what makes me believe like your your little crew, your generation, were just not ordinary people. You were sent here from previous births. I'm not sure to to do a mission because I it took me so many. I had to jump through so many hoops to get to the point of where this guy laying down with an, something growing out of his navel. That's God. It took me a lot to to accept that. Who are you? <laughs> Who are you, Malati, David? It's fallen soul. 
Prabhupada didn't tell us so. He said that all of us had formerly been associated with Lord Chaitanya. Wow. What? 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 He I said didn't. We'd all, we'd all been associated with Lord Chaitanya, but we didn't finish our business. Okay. No, wow. Wow. Business. wow. That's incredible. <laughs> Now, now you know, I, it, I mean, Lord Saitanya's associates included plants, creepers, trees. You could have been but a I, creeper. So what did you say? What, <laughs> I don't think we, you were a creeper. <laughs> no, I might have been a creep. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you might have given me creepa. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Malati Prabhu, um, there's so much that could be said about the coming months and years in your service. Shortly after that, you went down to San Francisco and Prabhupada came, Mukunda and Janaki brought, they set up a big program where the Grateful Dead played and Janis Joplin played and, and Allen Ginsberg introduced Srila Prabhupada um, to, to the to San Francisco at that time, which was, you know, and at Moby that time. I'm sorry? And another band, Moby Grape. And Moby Grape also played. Moby Grape. And, and um, because I opened a little center in Athens, Ohio, yeah. and it turns out one of the band members from Moby Grape is living down there. <laughs> No kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, they got to be somewhere. All these guys have to be somewhere. True. I'm sure they all have been touched. Probably, and you know better than most anybody, all these like big heroes of rock and roll, probably so many of them have been touched by the Maha Mantra. Um, you were probably witnessing them. Huh? The Maha Mantra Arpasadam. Arpasadam, yeah. 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 Malachi, I just want to get a perspective. How old were you when... Uh, their car pulled up to your ranger station in the Oregon. How old were you about? I was, I had basically just turned 21. Okay. Okay. I, August yeah. 30th, and this was like maybe September, late September or something. Hmm. Wow. Now, now, so shortly after that year in San Francisco, Prabhupada comes and he spends some months there. You get to know him. You get a deeper introduction into bhakti practice, and 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 you become practitioners. And then you yourself get initiated into the into the bhakti. Right away, the initiation happened <laughs> almost immediately. <laughs> Came on January seventeenth, and like a day or two later, Ma Melanie Nagel became Malati Devi Das. And that was, and, this, and from that point on, your life's been oh. devoted. Amazing. And, and so then, you know, it wasn't long after that. It was, I guess, it was a a year or two years or so um no. that a year maybe that you went to london it was a year and nine months a year and nine months yeah. and, and and so this no, group eight months, eight months. A year, okay a year and eight months later um you're now a mother a newly you know a, a brand new mother right you had a, a, a totally clueless mother Okay. Okay. Clueless mother, very okay. devoted but clueless mother, and, <laughs> and um, and you all and and you and these it was three couples, um, yeah. th three married couples. You were sent, or maybe you volunteered, but in any case, you all went to London well, to. It was Shum Sinder's idea. He had this idea. We're going to go to London. We're going to meet the Beatles out, outside the box sinker. And, and Mukunda went up to Prabhupada and goes, what do you think about Shem Sindra's idea of going to London to meet the Beatles? And I don't even know if Prabhupada knew what the Beatles were. Yeah. But, oh, Prabhupada asked, Shem, uh, asked Mukunda, so what do you think of this idea? And Mukunda says, well, because he knows Shem Sindra, they went to read college together. He goes, well, it just might work. And that was all the engagement <laughs> Prabhupada needed. <laughs> okay. So it was just a hint. Just a sniff of a possibility of magnifying the Hare Krishna Mahamantra yeah. and introducing people to Krishna consciousness. Go for it. Well, when was we... it to open a temple, Kastuba, or was it just to meet the Beatles? Oh, this, don't ask me, ask her. Oh, Malati, is it? <laughs> oh, but in order to open the temple, our idea was, you know, the, the book Bhagavad Gita, what the great man does, the common man will follow, right? Yeah. So who were the greatest people on the planet at that time was this rock band called the Beatles. Yeah. So <laughs> our thought process, you know, Shamsundar picked up on this, right? Meet the Beatles, they chant Hare Krishna, the whole world will chant Hare Krishna. That was, it was a simple it's plan. smart. It's simple <laughs> math. It's simple math. Why go to the bottom? Why not just go right for the top? <laughs> and so Especially when you're nobody. 
<laughs> well, you know, yes, yeah, and that's the thing is that when we interviewed Shama Sundar, who was your husband at the time, his, what he was really what he emphasized more than anything was you all had this feeling like magic is happening at every moment and anything is possible. And, and, and so you just all, you know, without really any money, you're a brand new mother. I think your daughter was like six weeks old at the time or so. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. yeah. And, and you go off to London, not knowing anyone there, we really not having any money. Card. We had no credit card. I don't even know if they existed. There was yeah. no cell phones. <laughs> I looked at that and I, how did we do that? <laughs> <laughs> you did it. And and so yes, shortly after you know um, you did meet the Beatles, and and particularly George Harrison was was uh, took a, took a very strong interest in Bhakti, and from there you recorded this hit heart. record. George Good heart, a deep, a very yeah. deep heart. Mm. Uh, and 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 from there, you know, any one of these phases, we could go deep and we could talk for hours about San Francisco. We could talk for hours about uh, London and the Beatles. But John, there, perhaps we could talk about John. Talk about John. We could talk about Ringo. Talk about we could John. talk about so. But um, but then you from there you went to to India with yeah, Srila Prabhupada. We were um, we received a letter with an aerogram. I don't think they make them anymore. But got this aerogram typed out, and Prabhupada said, "Now is the time to begin the World Sankirtan movement," which he talked about quite often, mm -hmm. and. He listed 10 names, so myself, Sham Sinder, was also included, Viridas Jamuna. Mukunda wasn't on that list. Um, so then at the bottom, of the, you wanted us to meet him in India, at the bottom in his handwriting, and baby Saraswati. <laughs> baby Saraswati, your daughter. She made the list, all right? Made the list. <laughs> so, so in other words, Srila Prabhupada is like, I'm, I'm taking people from the West that have taken an interest in Bhakti, my... my my students, my disciples, I'm going to bring them back to India. And we're just going to, and we're going to be a team that travels around just like spreading bhakti, you know, bringing bhakti back to India in a sense and, and traveling around the world with this team. And I guess you must have been excited to be on that list. Um, you know, we didn't get like, I mean, we got enthusiastic. Prabhupada explained yeah. that the Vaishnavas don't get excited. He goes, that's mundane, but very enthusiastic, yes. Okay. Looking forward to, um, but not knowing what we were going to be confronted with. Yeah. And, and we and, didn't go as tourists. You know, we didn't go, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go there. Yeah. We were focused on the mission, and wherever we went was only by the request of Sri Prabhupada, um, who had been requested by whoever it was that was inviting us to this place or that place. You, it, you know, it was amazing how Prabhupada was like one of these, almost like one of these Tony Robbins self-help gurus. Like he could fit into that because his vision was so much bigger than what was actually happening. He's like, we're going to start an international society, yet nothing's there. And we're going to start the, the international Sankirtan mission. And you're gonna, about to pull up to a rice field. It's like the, <laughs> the master sees what no one else can see hundreds of years down the line. It's quite incredible. And so um, we're going to get into your journey into Mayapur, Gustub. Okay. Well, yeah, let, let me just share just one. Uh, there, there are, what I want our audience to get a picture of was that these, these young disciples who were very new to Bhakti, but had this very deep devotion because of Prabhupada and who he was and, and having that close association with him, that they're ready to do anything for him and and, and they were like very very surrender they really just gave their entire lives and there's two stories you know i think that time in india really illustrated a lot of incredible self self-sacrifice and there are two stories that i always think of one of them has to do with yamuna devi your friend from that point she was also you know part of those th three couples that went to london and then she also went on to india and there's one story where she's on a train with Srila Prabhupada like an overnight yeah. train. And uh, there's some gentleman that Srila Prabhupada meets. He's read in the newspapers because you made quite a splash when you returned to India and people were writing, you know, Bhakti is spreading in the Western world and this Swami Bhakti Vedanta has come back with his students. So he had read about this. He was impressed by it. He wanted to do some service. It must have been a wealthy man. And he's sitting with Prabhupada on the train and he says, I would like to start a temple for you in whatever city that he was about to get off the train on. 
wasn't traveling on the train. He met ah. the train. He met the train in Delhi, got on the train just to meet Prabhupada. Ah, okay. Trying to connect with him and the devotees in Mumbai, which was Bombay at that time. Yeah. In the itinerary. And they were coming back from Chandigarh. Okay. So and, he, yep. he, he implored to Prabhupada. I want to, you know, we, we want you to come. We want you to, you know, we'll take, we'll, we'll arrange everything for you. And Prabhupada said, well, I can't because I've got programs set ahead in Bombay, but I can send my students. And right then and there, Jamuna Gurudas, Banu, who's now Banu Swami, and Giri Raj, who's now Giri Raj Swami, were deputed mm -hmm. to go with this unknown man. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, he, you know, you just got off the train and went, you know. I was thinking that it... You know, you're traveling through India, and India back then was like, you know, um, everything was like, for a Western person, just so difficult to accomplish anything. But but you were with Prabhupada, so you had that. And then in just a moment, he says, okay, go off with him and start this temple. And, and now you're, <laughs> and, and they were like, okay, she'll probably, let's do it. That, like their lives, they gave their lives entirely. Mm -hmm. And the other story that I always think about, and, and I mentioned this to you before and the I show. And I want to say one more thing about that. Because so yes. it was Jaguna and, you know, Gurudas, Giriraj, and Banu. And in a letter shortly afterwards, in a little letter exchange, Prabhupada said, practically speaking, Jaguna is the leader of this group, of yeah. this party. <laughs> so such an amazing uh, soul. And, and so the other thing that always struck me was one story where Prabhupada said something to you, and and, and the phrase that he used, um, when I heard that, I just thought, well, boy, you must have felt like I can just die right now, like my life has just been perfected. You know, it, it, it's such it the, the what he said almost sounds a little morbid, but actually, when you really think about it, it's really a, an incredibly deep expression of love. And could you tell that story uh, that I'm bringing up? It's it's my favorite cooking for Prabhupada story. Okay. <laughs> um, I did did cooking for Prabhupada. And um, it's not something, I don't know, Prabhupada's cooked. It's not that way at all. You're like, you're just always deeply engrossed in the, in the possibility you might please him you know, by, <laughs> by your service. Yeah. And um, I'm not like Jamuna. Jamuna is a very deep person. You know, I'm not that kind of person. But I'm a willing person and um so i would take on things sometimes that were over my head without realizing they were over my head and this <laughs> cooking uh, situation there in mayapur was one of those moments because mayapur was not developed at all so so we should say mayapur is this very holy place in west bengal on the bank of the ganges river which is the birthplace of sri chaitanya and uh, Srila Prabhupada wanted to establish what would become in the future, and is even becoming now, this like world center for, for Krishna Bhakti. And, but at that point, it was nothing but rice fields out there, in, in and, one sense. And, and when, when I, if you've been, I'm, I'm sure you've been there lately, but, uh, you know, I hadn't gone since 1991, and I went the last couple of years, and it's so developed. It's like, it's like a massive campus, and people go there just thinking it's always been like this and it just wasn't it was like now people like myself go there and i get upset like oh the pizza place is closed today oh i can't get my pizza today but your version of mayapur was a field basically can you explain the, the setting yeah there was one road into mayapur that was barely paved mostly potholes there was no any type of conveniences like a gas station, petrol station. Um, there weren't even the chai wallas, the tea wallas, or the sabji, the vegetable, nothing. The only thing on that road were the Gaudiya temples, the beautiful yoga piyat, you know, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's uh, place, Bhakti Vinod's place. And then there was a post office on the opposite side. That was it. And then you just were going down this little rutted road and suddenly the bus stopped. Now this road dead ends into a confluence of two rivers, the Hooghly and the Gunga. If you see an aerial picture of this photo of these, this confluence, which nowadays because of drones, you get these fantastic pictures. It's just really amazing. You see this one brown river flowing into a beautiful blue river. Yeah, the Gunga, yeah. So 
Um, we get down off of this, so the bus stops and apparently this was where we were and we're looking around, this is our destination and there is nothing but a little shack out in the middle of a rice paddy. There is, um, there's some plumbing, it's a pump, a hand water pump. We're no gonna call drainage. that plumbing. We're gonna call that plumbing. <laughs> yeah. Yep, plumbing. There was no drainage, so to get your water, you had to stand in mud, but it was holy mud. Um, then way out in the field, we saw some kind of a platform. That was it. And just, be, you know, and I'm wondering, what am I going to do? Well, I just, as soon as I thought that, somebody came up and they said to me, come on, I'll show you your kitchen. So I kind of expected I might be cooking for Prabhupada because my husband was his um, secretary and quite often that happened. So they took me around to the other side of the hut, which was actually Prabhupada's quarters. And that was it. You're just on the other side of the hut. Everything was opened out. There's a few not so fresh vegetables. I had a trunk that I carried my basics with. And in the trunk, there was two stoves. One was this, um, like a mud bucket, a bucket that you line with mud and you put a couple iron bars on top and then cow dung in, you know, that would you could cook with. The other one was these exquisite kerosene stoves that you pump, pump, pump and <coughs> They blew up and singed your eyebrows and burned your hair. Um, so that was my cooking equipment. There was no table. I had a knife that I, I forget the name of them, but it's a board with a curved knife on it. So it's like curved like this. And oh, yeah, those things. I, you can scrape out Ginsu, the coconut. I, think it's I just called it a foot Ginsu. knife. Okay. <laughs> and that's what I used, you know. There was no countertop. There was like nada, nothing. And... Um, somehow got along i didn't even know my as soon as they took me off to cook i don't even know where my daughter went I didn't, you know it's like i saw her every once in a while but part of the cooking just to get a little further idea of the situation was the cook had to go to the treasurer to get a few rupees to purchase the boga the boga means the food vegetables and all for Prabhupada. and to do that you had to go across the river to Navadweep. There wasn't anything in my Mayapur. Mm. And, uh, you know, one of the duties of a treasurer is that he has to safeguard the treasury. So no is the word you hear the most. When you're, <laughs> you know, you're, I mean, it was tough. Like, you know, I wanted to get a pineapple once for Prabhupada. And he goes, no, because he only eats part of it. You know, I mean, we had no money. So it was really you know, don't look down upon it. Oh my God. I mean, it was tough there. And so I would start out, you know, there was a little battle there, a little tension. To and get, then, to get a few rupees to get a few rupees. To buy food. <laughs> It'd be hard to cook the lunch without a food. We without had, food. Uh, you know, as like, okay, we were married, but jihasters, right? We had no income because we were with the mission. We were following pro sure. you know, so when when i would go i would leave leave our little place go down the road sometimes with my daughter and then you'd have to get on a boat to go across the river and before you now there's a like a proper ticket type of thing but if that was nothing like that you would down this slow far away on the boat there was I say fought your way because there was a fellow who stood there and would accost you and try to get money out of you before you could pass him to get on the boat. And he had no official position. He just was a self-made entrepreneur. We had to fight with him. And then he'd get on the boat. And um, I don't know that there was exactly a fixed price because everybody was arguing and they hadn't seen, you know, too many people with this kind of skin before. And we landed on the and they would touch us like this and then look at their finger to see if, you know, if that whiteness <laughs> would come off. I mean, so there was again, no, you know, forget, forget about internet. There was no like television back then. So you really were very isolated. What to speak of in these villages, which were, it was not <laughs> Delhi. It was, it wasn't even regular phones. Yeah. If you wanted to make a phone call, you'd have to go to, um, I think it was a beer Nagar or, this other place anyways Krishnagar. Krishnagar, yeah so yeah. you know i'd 
get over there and then to, to and then you'd have to go up the bank in Navadweep and there's another guy like the one who's a self-appointed you know toll money. toll man toll, toll collector <laughs> i couldn't give anything because they gave me so little and i had to take a rich guy to go to the different markets another fight it was just like a battle and then you battle with the sub wall i battle with the street wall and if i had to get some dahi some yogurt or something you know you battle with that person and then the whole thing all over again to get back so by the time we would be back to start cooking it was like i'd already been through a war and now i had to like start in and i was constantly constantly just thinking how to please him and every day it seemed like there was some little thing that wasn't quite right. And he would let me know. I mean, he wasn't ever angry with me, but he would express in such a way I could understand. Like, um, I don't know much how much time we have here. I'll give a quick example. One time I was going to make this one preparation that involved eggplant. Mm. And I made little tiny squares. And then I put it in the cooker one of those three-tiered cookers with compartments, right? So I put mm. it in there, bring it out, I put it on this plate. And somehow that day I was thinking, I think I might have got it, you know? A little pride crept in. I give the plate to Prabhupada. He takes a spoon and he goes, oh, so you are feeding me worm? In one of the little squares of eggplant, there had been oh, a little no. worm that didn't, the knife, he was, he was hidden. He couldn't yeah. go, goes the heat, he came out. And the first spoonful, Shiva Prabhupada got oh. that word. Yeah. You know, it was like, oh my God. So then trying again next day, do the best, you know. And part of making his plate up, nowadays they call it, what do they call it? Plating? You know, they make your plate, you know, plate it up. Anyways, so part of plating Prabhupada's prasadam is you put a little salt, a little pepper, little chopped up ginger, adrak, and uh, nimbu, lime, piece of lime. That was on the side. Mm -hmm. And so that day, again, I was, you know, so intent on this. And I was thinking that maybe I got it today. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, you know, I took it in. He looked, he goes, why so much salt? I mean, it was just on the side of the plate, right? Mm -hmm but more than you need. So that day I thought, maybe I'm the wrong person for this service because it seems like I'm not hitting the mark. And um, it wasn't like out of some kind of defeat, but because I wanted Prabhupada to have the best and I didn't seem to be pulling it off in my estimation. It didn't seem that was happening. So I got this idea that I was thinking about this and I thought, I'll get somebody else who can do it better. You know, I've got a, you know, it's like I have a husband, a kid, I got this whole shopping, and maybe somebody else should be doing this. So as soon as I thought that, I'll get somebody else that can do it even better. My anxiety started to subside. And I thought, I'll tell Prabhupada tomorrow. I'll get somebody else. I had somebody in mind. I'll get somebody else. So the next day, I heard that his godbrothers were coming for lunch. That was a big deal because there had been some little tensions in both directions. So it was a big deal that they were coming. And I thought, well, it's towards us and towards Prabhupada. One of the criticisms, aside from the fact that he left India and associated with Malachis from the West, was that um, he had a lady cooked. Hmm. Um, and of course, that lady was me. So <laughs> he was a little sensitive about that because he didn't want to be the cause of your, you know. So they were they were implying that it, there was for a sannyasi for a renunciate to have a female cook would be yeah. it was somehow. Maybe they didn't not know my husband was also serving, but I knew that that had been because I was told about it from some of the devotees. So then, but I, they weren't criticizing me. They just said, "Oh, you know," they were saying this. So there they were for lunch. It was a big deal. So I didn't even go to Prabhupada that morning because I thought for sure I'm not going to be, you know. And then next thing you know, somebody's Prabhupada wants you. Prabhupada wants you. So I go in there. 
And he just starts telling me what he wanted for lunch that day. So I thought, well, now's not the time to, you know, <laughs> switch up the food. cook, yeah. Yeah. you know, and Anand Prabhu, who was his godbrother, would be cooking for everyone else. So Anand was such a sweet man, humble person. Um, he would serve us when it should have been the other way around. So there I'm cooking that day. And this um, hut is now the hut that's there. It's still there, but it's a little bit enlarged. And it's not as shabby as it was. Like um, in the back, there's the main room for Prabhupada, then a little small room where his secretary and servant would keep their things. And maybe one of them slept there. There was, amazingly enough, an electric light bulb dangling from a cord in, in the middle of that room where he was. So I go up there. I have the plate in my hand. I kind of pushed the, oh, the curtain. The curtain was really elegant. It was a burlap sack that used to hold rice. A rice, old rice bag. <laughs> I pushed that curtain aside and I look in, you know, in that dimly lit room, there was Srila Prabhupada. And on one side were two of these very venerable, saintly Gaudiya Vaishnav God brothers. On the other side, I mean, I just remember three, but there might have been four. But I'm looking in, and I'm, I'm just kind of struck. I'm, I, I'm, it was going quickly, but still, I didn't immediately go in. I'm seeing this scene. And, you know, they were very venerable, very saintly looking. And Prabhupada was at the head of the room. He was like more illuminated than the light bulb. And I was thinking, this is like he's a diamond. And they're the setting, you know, like when you put a diamond, if you just have a plain diamond, okay, it's very nice. You put it in the setting and it becomes even nicer. So that was the thought that went through my mind at that moment. And then I had to go in. But now I felt intimidated seeing these, you know, people. They were they were spiritual leaders in their own right, in a sense, right? Yeah, like but they were very you know, and, elderly, maybe yeah. even older than pro, but, you know, it was obviously they were very saintly personalities. So, you know, even if they had criticism, I mean, they were right to make what, you know, if, between peers, you can say things. So I've suddenly felt intimidated, which was a little bit unusual for me. So I just took my sari and I pulled it way over my head. So you couldn't even see my face. I got down on my elbows and knees with only my hand holding the tully, the plate. Mm. And I crawled into the room and I took the plate down. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada, and I'm making my full obeisance now, and he says, yes, she cooks for me, and he goes, and I criticize her. The minute he said that, it was like, wow, my mindset had been so wrong, because I was taking it like criticism, when actually he was just answering me, and I was thinking, what can I do to make it better? How can I please him? So he would tell me. In my foolish immaturity, I'm thinking it was criticism. So he goes, yes, she cooks for me, and I criticize her. Then he paused, and he says, but she would slit her throat for me, and I would do the same for her. Hmm. Oh. Oh. And I understood that he wasn't just talking about me. He was expressing to these godbrothers the relationship that he had with his disciples and that we had with him. So that was the profundity of that moment. I will yeah, say I, I didn't quit. The next day, I went back again to the treasure, to the whole show, getting back to another week, getting back. It was a totally different experience. Uh, it was like feeling this battle before. It was a battle. Now it was just totally ecstatic because it cleared my consciousness. That's amazing. You know, it is so significant uh, what he said. And, and to, to just kind of, flesh out the context just a little bit more was that you know these are as you're saying these are like um people so steeped in this culture in, in this the spiritual lineage you know as deep as you can get and in one sense Prabhupada was bringing back these people from the west that were coming straight out of the hippie scene and and you mm -hmm. know it was all new to them it was a completely different culture it was not learned but but Prabhupada recognized the the sincerity of the full surrender and so when he said that, it was like saying to his God brothers, to these other spiritual leaders, that these people are, th th these, these students of mine, 
They've given everything for God. They've given everything. You know, they'll, they'll serve me. They'll, they would slit their throat for me. And, and, and it's touched me so much, and our connection is so deep. I would, I would do, do the, the same, same for them. That I would do the same. Yeah. Exactly the whole picture right there. Yeah. That was, it wasn't on Way Street. Yeah. It, and yeah. You know what he was saying? I have your back. He always had her back. We just had to accept him. You know, that it's such a tall order. First of all, to cook for the guru, even in a trophy American kitchen, is tough enough. You're learning a whole nother. It's not like you were a trained chef in Bengali cooking. This is something like you're pra practically hustling to learn. Then it's like it's not even a regular stove. You're cooking on cow dung. That's a whole nother art. Then you're in a field where you're camping out. If I just say, go stupid, go camping out for a week. That's hard enough. If I say, go camping out and put on a sari, just wearing a sari is a tall order for an American. What to speak of cooking, take care wearing of a sari, <laughs> camping out, taking care of a child. Even if you were to say, I'm just going to come visit the Swami with my child, that would be tough enough. What to speak of all the other stuff you had to go through. It's quite amazing. And it's, it's, this, you could have got malaria, which I think you did. I think I got everything. I got malaria, scarlet fever. Jaundice. We oh, <laughs> jaundice. We, we would get, you know, the deli belly. <laughs> the, you know, it was yeah. intense. It was well, intense. You, you know, we're, we're almost out of time, but, uh, you know, obviously the connection that you and, and your close friends had with Srila Prabhupada was something just very, very special. And you had that intimate time with him. And in through that statement, he demonstrated, as you're saying, this, this, connection going both ways it wasn't just a sycophantic charismatic guru scene where like it was going one way but you're you were all dedicated to each other and um now you know Srila Prabhupada passed away in 77 so many decades have passed now uh since he's gone I I would just maybe you could end just by sharing how you how that relationship is for you now how how you how you feel Srila Prabhupada's presence in your life or, or what that relationship means today and how it's alive in your life. Thank you. Yes. Without time to go into things, um, it was never, you know, there wasn't always, always a smooth journey. And I'm not just talking about the living conditions and, you know, the conditions of the mind and the senses and the body and et cetera. But Srila Prabhupada, by his own example and words, assured us of his continual presence in our life. And for me, at least, it is more substantial today than it was at that time. Hmm. And how is that? But is it when you pick up his books? I didn't really have a grasp on the thing. When I read these books, take the first canto. I, I don't know if can you hear. You you, you cut out on us a little bit little there, but here. Uh, can you hear? It, it, it cut out just a bit. Connection is unstable. Yeah, mm -hmm. it cut out just a bit. But if so, you could just repeat what you just said. So, just take the first canto of the Bhagavatam. He told us everything I have to teach you is in this book, and that was mm -hmm. the only we had at the time. The mm -hmm. first canto was three parts. But when you start reading that, my God, it's so intensely of the present. And yet he did the translations and the purports prior to coming to America. Yeah. Late 50s, 60s. It's as if, I mean, take any disasters that's going on in the world today, and he's describing it and why it's happening and how it's happening and what we have to do. And there's an agenda. It's pure bhakti. Thank you. You know, thank you so much for sharing that. It's um, very extraordinary. Yeah, unfortunately, you're cutting out a little bit on us right now, but I, I think we, we made it through the entire show, Malati G. We made it through the entire show. Now it's now the Internet's crapping out just a little bit, but it, it was so honored to have you and share all these stories. The message board's going out of control. One John Lennon story, one George Harrison story. One little throw, throw us something here. But 
I don't know. Do you have one? You did live with John Lennon, didn't you? I think we live we live with John and George. But by the way, please understand something. We were never like, oh my God, the Beatles. Because I know that's just me. That's just me. Was <laughs> it was a flicker in the wind. We had Srila Prabhupada. Nobody mm. could come up to him. We were giving Prabhupada to these famous persons. Mm. We had something to offer them. Yeah. So we weren't intimidated by their fame. And that yeah. was one of the reasons there was a rapport, especially with George. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Thank Malati you. Malati Prabhu, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. We appreciate your we appreciate your coming here. We appreciate your entire life of devotional service. It means so much to us, and uh, it, it means a lot for you to come and share a little bit with us today and with our listeners. So beautiful. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we are really, really honored to have Malati Prabhu on the show. She's so inspiring. I want to be just like her. You mind me saying that, Malati? Can I be just like you? Can you pray that I can be just like you? <laughs> she fro Okay, I think I have her blessings there. <laughs> and um, thanks, everybody. We're back to our normal time tomorrow, 6 a.m. for Monday's Bhagavatam study. If you want to join us on Zoom, do it. Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com. Thanks for everybody supporting us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Wisdom of the Sages. We appreciate everybody who contributes. And lots of stuff happening this week. We're going to dive back into the fourth canto. 6 a.m. tomorrow, Eastern time. If you got any questions for us, you can write us, wisdom of the sages 108 at gmail.com. Join us upstate with Sachi Nanda Maharaj. That's going to be wonderful. Um, go to, where do they go for that? Uh, they can email Bhakti, Bhakti Retreats 108. Join us at the farm for um, our wisdom of the sages at the farm retreat. And then we're going to have, I think, a little Pani Hati festival over 4th of July. What do you think about that, Kostuba? <laughs> I didn't know it was a Pani Hati festival. I know. <laughs> I might just put we might just put a Pani Hati twist on it. Yeah, okay. And, um, yeah, I want to start an annual Holy Festival and Pani Hati festival and maybe combine the two. What do you think about that? <laughs> we can talk about it. <laughs>